Well, we talked a few weeks ago. We actually started a series called My Family. I think that's what we called it. We called it a lot of different things. I jokingly tell people, and that's really not a joke, the two of the hardest things I have to do in ministry is title my messages and dress myself <laughs> to where it matches. <laughs> I mean, I know how to put my pants on, but I'm just saying if I don't put the right colored ones on sometime, and uh, I don't always match. But uh, God's helping us because if we're going to have a strong communities, it's going to start not with strong churches, but it's going to start with strong homes. And we talked Wednesday before last about joy in the home. Now, realistically, uh, we could just preach that same message again. It'd be okay. But I'm not going to do that because you can get online and listen to it. And if I said some things that rubbed you the wrong way, that's okay because I always say things that rub me the wrong way because the Holy Spirit wants to correct me, make some adjustments in my life. And um, I found out the more that I allow him to have a hold of the steering wheel, the better off my life will become. And when I drove here this morning, I had to make corrections to that steering wheel from the time I pulled out of my driveway to the time I pulled in and hit park. Had to constantly make, make corrections. If you don't allow the Holy Spirit from time to time to correct you, don't ever expect him to be able to direct you. Amen. If you want to be under the Holy Spirit's direction, and most all of us say, well, I just, Holy Ghost, I just want you to lead. The problem is you don't like being corrected. Or maybe not you, but maybe it's me I'm talking about. Oh, sorry, I got myself mixed up with you. Yeah, I don't like being corrected either. My flesh don't. But actually, the Bible says a wise man, a wise man or a woman loves or embraces correction. Because if I embrace the correction, then I know my soul can be saved. I can be in the right place. I'm not talking about just missing hell. I'm talking about having God's best in your life. We've got to stay open to correction, but it requires some humility. Amen. But we've got to come to the realization, and most of us have come to this point, that we realize that God is smarter than we are. Yeah. Look at your neighbor and said, you know that? God's just smarter than you. He's got some things figured out that we're yet to figure out. And he knows your end better than you know your own beginning. Amen. He knows tomorrow better than we know yesterday. And if we just learn to follow him, then we can always be in the right place at the right time, the right time at the right, with the right people. Right place, right time, with the right people. Uh, but let's be open to some correction. Let's not walk in the counsel of the ungodly without even thinking about it. Let's take time to allow our mind to be renewed by the Word of God and to be able to walk in His ways. The Bible says His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And if we're ever going to walk in the ways of God, we've got to take the time to understand His thoughts. And you cannot understand His thoughts without getting into His Word and getting to know Him. Amen. So we talked about joy in the home, and we remember what joy, the acronym for joy started out with Jesus. Amen. And then there was others comes before you. In other words, the O comes before you. If you live your life where you put Jesus first, and then others second, and you come somewhere in the rear. In other words, when you live for happiness, you live to make please God and to make other people happy above yourself. Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest of all, you're going to have to learn how to be the greatest servant. I know I've heard, heard kids, and I had this idea that when I got older, nobody was going to tell me what to do. <laughs> how many ever got to that point where you're just like, I'll just be glad when I ain't got people to tell me what to do? Well, how many found out that that never happened? How many of you are 60, 70, 80 years old, and you found out there's always people above you telling you what you should be doing? Or what you're supposed to do. Matter of fact, if you ever get to the point where you have nobody telling you what to do, then you've rebelled somewhere. Amen. Um, so uh, it's not about just getting to the point where you're independent of other people over you. No, you learn how to operate as a team. Amen. So we're learning how to be in submission to God. And when you have a fear of the Lord, if you look at when Moses had an encounter with God, he saw the burning bush. Um, you can't have an experience in an encounter with God and it not affect you. In other words, you're not, uh, not terrified of God, but there's a reverential awe. And it's sad, but a big part of the body of Christ have never had true encounters with God. And that's why they have a difficulty really heeding God's voice. In other words, they're, they're in one day, out the next. They're up one day, down the next. They're emotional roller coasters. Because when you come in line with, uh, when you have a true encounter with God, and you're not just living from one encounter that happened 30 years ago, but you're having encounter, daily encounters with God. Yes. Just like you'd have daily encounters with people in your home. 
I mean, you live to the point where you're aware of their presence. And when you're aware of their presence, you do certain things that's in compliance with their will. Amen. So you live your life, and you're in constant encounters with God. And I'm talking about one you had 20 years ago. I'm not talking about the one you had last Sunday in church. I'm talking about the one you had this morning. You have fresh encounters of heaven. Then there's a, a revelation that you begin to walk in that you're walking by faith and not by sight. In other words, you're still walking by sight, but you're walking from your spiritual uh, knowing rather than just a natural, physical sight. You realize that when you're born, every child essentially is born blind. They start out blind, and their eyes have to develop. And you know, the enemy wants to keep you physically blind, but he also wants to keep you mostly spiritually blind. You heard the song, you've heard the song uh, Amazing Grace? I was blind, but now I see. Was it talking about physical sight? No, it's talking about spiritually. The enemy wants to keep you blinded to the plans of God. He wants to keep you blinded of what, the, what, what God has available for you. When you begin to see things differently, you begin to act differently, don't you? And so God just doesn't want you reading about him. He wants you to see him. Have daily experiences with him. What's something that we always have you say? I know him. I see him. I hear him. I follow him. Amen? Yes. Y'all still awake? Yes. <laughs> How many of you ever heard the expression, seeing is believing? Okay, but we know according to faith teaching, that's not correct. But actually, if you go a little bit deeper, it actually becomes correct again. Because yes. God has designed you uh, to live by what you see. So the enemy tries to place an inferior substitute, and he wants you to go by what you see naturally. God says, I want you to go by what you see spiritually. What did he tell Abraham? He said, Abraham, look to the sky. What do you see? Oh, what's he trying to do? He's trying to get him to see some things differently than the way he's been seeing them, isn't he? And so I, for the sake of time, I'm not going to review everything that we talked about, but we had a week off because we got so excited about other things. Um, but if you want joy in your home, it's going to start out with you primarily. I'm not dealing with everybody else in your home. I'm talking to you. Just point yourself say, I'm talking to me, or he's talking to me right now. Because the problems in your home is not everybody else's fault. <laughs> say la. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that there's not co other contributors. But you can't control other people. You can't fix other people with your faith. You focus on you with your faith, and then you allow that to communicate to others. If you want to win uh, an unbeliever over, it's primarily going to be done with people that's in your relationship or your network with your chaste conduct, conduct or your lifestyle. Amen? Now, God's called us to reach the world with preaching. But the people you live with, they're not going to listen to what you're saying if what you're doing is undermining every word that you say. Amen? And so what, what I found out is I'm going to be saying what I'm seeing. That's why I want to change what I'm looking at. If you're constantly just saying what you see physically, you're empowering what you say, uh, what you see to remain or to get stronger. So if all you're aware of is everything that looks like in around you that's going to hell and you keep prophesying that and you're still complaining and murmuring and just basically just voicing the fact or you're reading the news. You turn on the news, they're telling you what's going on, how things are. Okay, if that's all you ever fellowship with, then you don't know any different. That's what you're looking at and that's what you're creating around you. I mean, thank God for being informed and what's going on. I'm not, this is not my message, but you've got to change what you're looking at if you want to change your lifestyle. You are really the sum total of your relationship. Show me your five closest friends, and I'll show you a picture of you in a few years if you're not already just like them. Amen. So if, if I am who I hang around with, and I am what I, what I view or what I look at regularly, then I'm going to hang around with the Holy Ghost, and I'm going to look at His Word. Because I'll become what I behold. Amen. You all still happy? So we talked about joy and having joy in the home. And really that started out with, if you look in Ephesians chapter 5, and we talked about this because this scripture is taken out of context a lot. Ephesians 5, 22, how many men have this scripture on your refrigerator? No, you don't have your refrigerator. You don't, this is not a refrigerator scripture unless you want to get divorced. 
Because the scripture says, wives be in submission to your husbands. Well, that's not my text scripture. The text scripture we're looking at is the scripture ahead of that, which says, what's it say? Ephesians 5, 21. Anybody remember that? You can put that up on the screen if you got it. Ephesians 5, 21. That's not it. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 21. Is it back there? Nobody's home. All right. Ephesians 5, 21. Nobody's going to know it. I, it says, be in submission one to another in the fear of God. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Okay, reverence is going to follow an encounter with Jesus. There it is. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, if you back on up a few more verses, it talked about being filled with the Holy Ghost, didn't it? Remember the scripture said, do not be drunk with wine. Where's in excess? But be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Amen. If you lack fear of the Lord, it's because you're not staying full of the Holy Ghost. And if you want joy in your home, everybody in your house needs to be staying full of the Holy Ghost. Being filled with the Holy Ghost will solve a lot of your problems. Now, being filled with the Holy Ghost does not guarantee you a life without problems, but it guarantees you victory over every problem. It's where I'm not so consumed by problems. That way, if somebody asks you how you're doing, you don't think of the 10 biggest problems you have. You think of how big your God is and how strong he is on your behalf. That's the first thing that comes up. If somebody asks you how you're doing, and the first thing that comes to mind is all your struggles, then you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. You're filled with problems. So don't wait until you have no more problems to focus your attention on something other than your problems. No, the way out of your problems is to change your focus away from the problems onto the answer. Smith Wigglesworth said, uh, he said, the only way to, uh, the only safeguard from being drawn back into your natural mind is to be filled and filled again with the Holy Ghost. And we know his testimony that before he got out of the bed every morning that he would pray himself full of the Holy Ghost. In other words, he would open his heart. He began to praise and magnify God, speak in other tongues. He said, I would not get out of bed until I was freshly filled with the Holy Spirit. Then he would get up out of bed and he would dance around for nine to 12 minutes in his bedroom before he left his room, just explaining to God how grateful he was to be part of the family of God, how glad he was to be saved, how glad he was to be in the plan of God, how glad he was to be called into the ministry, how thrilled he was to know that heaven was not his... Uh, just his home in the future, but it's where he's living from now. And I don't know about you, but I have yet to raise 30 some people from the dead. He didn't start his ministry until his late 50s, early 60s, but he lived up into, the, I think, 86, 87 years old, and he changed nations. And he couldn't even read when he first got saved. He got filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, I just want to be able to read the Bible. He, Lester Summerall was going to come visit him, brought, brought his newspaper. He said, you can come in, but leave that trash outside. Come on, it wasn't a dirty magazine. It was a newspaper. He said, leave that trash outside. Well, that's just being, you know, that's just being too, uh, too radical. Yeah, and saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and changing nations. Amen. So, look at your neighbor and say, just stay filled. Of course, you've got to get filled first to stay filled. And if you're not filled today, we'll give you an opportunity. We'll get you filled before you leave. Praise the Lord. Amen. You don't have to be filled to go to heaven. But you do have to be filled to follow God. Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem without this experience. Amen. Everybody still happy? All right, we're done reviewing. Let's see where we're going. Somebody say honor. Honor, honor in the home. Honor in the New Living Translation of Ephesians 5.21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I want to add this because this, this um, is a truth that you'll see from the Word. Honor becomes a natural outflow of those who are filled with the Holy Ghost. The fear of the Lord is a natural outflow of someone who has an encounter with God or is freshly filled with the Holy Spirit. But then a natural outflow of the fear of the Lord is honor and humility. If you're having trouble showing honor, now, it's easy to show honor to people when they're acting honorably. 
Just look straight ahead for all you married people. Now, this is not just a message about marriage. Because you learn how to show honor in the kingdom of God. Remember, we talked about this, that God sets the lonely in families. If, if you don't have a good example to look back to as an earthly father or earthly mother or earthly role models. In other words, every role model that you had, you thought you could confide in and trust, and they end up betraying you. Well, let me tell you something. That is not your uh, example that you have to be restricted and limited to. In other words, if you are at... If God would hold you accountable for something that your parents did, then there's no hope for any of us. And so if you were raised in a home that was broken... You had an absentee father, absentee mother, or maybe you didn't have either a mother or father, or the mother and father that you did have were not proper examples and role models. Uh, the Bible says God will set you in families to help sustain you. He will set the lonely in families. And so this is one way he does it. Remember the first session we talked about my family? I said, no, you don't be talking about my mama. And we shouldn't, it shouldn't be so easy to separate and d differentiate between your church family and your natural family. Because we don't see that much of a distinction in the New Testament. It's family. Huh? I mean, you're either in or you're out. Because if you've got some friends or family in high places, you can get some breakthroughs. Don't act like I'm, you know, making this stuff up. It's all about who you know. Life's about who you know. I got connections. I mean, we're in Logan, West Virginia. You got some political ties. You can get by with anything. Well, I got some ties that goes higher than Logan, West Virginia politics. I'm in the family. You understand? I got people. And so what we saw was if we can't take up for our church family or people in our family, the family of God, that's a pretty low level of spirituality. If people had learned to fight for one another in the family of God like they'd be willing to fight over somebody said something about their mama, listen, you ever gotten in a fight on the playground over what somebody said about your mama? I mean, there's some lines you don't cross. Well, what if we treated all of our family like that and somebody started speaking up about some of our family and said, wait a minute, wait, that's my sister. That's my brother. That's my mom. That's my dad. Who are you talking about right now? What'd you say? Say that again. You're, I watched Barney Fife, and this one guy, he cut on him real hard, and he said, I'm just waiting for you to cross the line. Well, he was already giving him down the road. I mean, he was making it pretty plain, and Barney said, I'm just waiting for you to go a little farther. Oh, say that to my face. Well, he was saying it to his face. But he didn't have no backbone to back it up. But it's time for the people of God to get a Holy Ghost backbone. Amen. When somebody says something about God that violates his word, you say, wait, wait, wait. That's my daddy you're talking about. Somebody says something about somebody you sit next to in church about the way their lifestyle is out church, outside of church. You're going to say, wait, 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 wait. That's my brother. That's my sister. Who are you talking about? Let's build them up. We're not here to call and to tear people down with our words. We're here to build them up. Amen? And so it's easier for you to exercise and exemplify honor when you've been freshly filled with the Holy Ghost. You've had an encounter with God. Jesus said, if you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it also unto me. Yeah. Remember in the communion scriptures, we see that many are weak and sickly among us because they don't rightly discern the Lord's body. Well, I believe in one, in one way you can interpret that is because people don't rightly discern that his body was broken for a physical healing, but secondly, that we are the body of the Lord. And if you don't rightly discern the people who are to the right and the left of you, because they are the Lord's body, they are the body of Christ. And so it, you, if, you, it's if, if it's easy for you to slam and talk about somebody in the body, I would have to maybe have a little bit of a difference on how much of the revelation of Christ you actually have. Because if you've got a real revelation of who Christ is and what he's done for you, you're not going to walk up, hug him, bow at him, and then kick somebody else. 
because it's still the Lord's body. So we're going to show honor and reverence to the Lord. And by doing that, we're also going to show honor and reverence to his body. Whether it's the toe, the finger, or the eyeball, or the mouth, we're going to show honor to the Lord. And the way it's easier to do that is when we're staying freshly filled with the Holy Ghost. If it's good for the kingdom, it's good for the house. Amen. What is the kingdom of God? It's not meat or drink. In other words, it's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not regulations, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you're having trouble with the lack of joy, then it may be that the relationship is strained. Because when the relationship's right, then there's peace there and joy is a natural outflow. Amen. And so if your home is struggling with no joy, it's probably because there's also an honor in deficiency. Let me give you some scriptures, all right? Let me, let me get back to my notes. My goodness, it's already getting late. All right. Real quick. Did y'all hear that? Now, how many of you was here during the service? Let me see your hand. All right. So we're not allowed to say that anymore. What's your hurry? You're an eternal creature. You're going to live forever. It's so like Joe Moore said, he said, Lord, he said, if I ever get time, he said, I think I'm going to learn how to play the guitar. And God said, just learn how to play all of it. You're going to live forever. Yeah. Just learn how to play it all. Piano, drums, keyboard, harmonica. Just play it all. Praise the Lord. We've got all kinds of time to practice. What you rush? All right. Real quick. <laughs> Fear of the Lord is a result of knowing God. If you don't know God, then you don't have any fear of the Lord. And if you don't have any fear of the Lord, then you're a dummy. That's what the Bible says. Is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Real wisdom comes from knowing God. Amen? So when you experience God personally, you begin to value Him, His presence, His Word, and His people. What does honor mean? Well, honor means to treat as valuable or to esteem or regard highly or to treat as favorable. So when we talk about honor, honor is a characteristic and a trait that is not practiced very much in our society. Everybody is out to step on somebody else to make themselves look good. They're going to try to blow everybody's candle out around them to make theirs look brighter. There's not much honor, and I'm going to tell you the reason why there's not much honor. Even we've allowed this to creep into churches, into our church family. And because there is no fear of the Lord, because there's no true encounters or true experiences with God, there's a lot of knowledge about God, but not very much revelation of God. Not much experience. The Bible says you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, that word know is not an intellectual term. It's actually a term of intimacy. It's the same kind of thought that said Adam knew his wife Eve, and she bore a son. The church as a whole, not this church, but a lot of other churches around here, they lack true encounters with God. There's not much knowledge of God. They can explain to you a lot about God. And they can quote a scripture. But one moment in the presence of God. Wow. He can do more in just a few seconds than weeks and weeks of seminars would do. We've got to learn how to engage his presence. We've spent too much time talking about God and not enough time visiting with him. What separates people who do great and notable deeds for God are people who carry the spirit of faith that they caught from the presence of the Holy Ghost himself. That's where I want to get, praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just be able to talk about God. I want to be able to allow him to demonstrate through me. Amen. Amen. Amen? I believe that's you too, isn't it? So if honor is to treat as valuable or to esteem highly or to regard favorably, if something's valuable to you, you'll do whatever it takes to take care of it. Now, I realize that we live in a generation, and I say we as being me. I'll be 44 years old this fall. I'm still a very young man. Praise the Lord. Very, very young. Um, the generations ahead of us, and I say us being my generation, and you may be in a couple generations ahead of me, uh, how many heard the term, they don't make things like they used to? Oh, yeah. I mean, we live in a generation, you know, of flea market goods, Dollar Tree, 
made in China. Okay, because now things are, a lot of things are not made valuable. How many found out that a lot of things in your house, if it breaks, it's easier just to get a new one than it is to repair what you've got? But if you buy something that's got much quality, come on, somebody. I've got a pair of shoes that I bought, I'd say probably in 2000 and, let me see here. I'd say probably, I think I bought them right when I got back from Bible school. So it was probably in 2004 or 2005. I wore those, there's a pair of work boots, and I've still got them work boots, and they're still just as tightly made as they was the day I bought them. My little boy, he's got a little pair of hunting boots that came from Walmart. He wore them a half a dozen times, and the sole's already coming off of them. But I bought a pair of Danner work boots, and I wore them things five, six days a week for several years, and they're not hurt. Well, I paid more than, you know, 1850 for them. And in most cases, and shoes is one of them things, you get what you pay for most often, especially dress shoes. I got a pair of Dan Post cowboy boots or alligator skin. Man, I tell you, I'll have them things when I die. If the Lord tarries at 100 years old, and they'll still be fine. I might have to resole them. But they're made out of something. And so the problem is because it's so easy, we can get stuff real cheap. Rather than wait and save and buy something good, we, to be able to fill the void, we go ahead and buy something that's cheaper made to have it now. But then it doesn't last. In just a few months' time, the thing's already broke, and it's easy to throw something in the trash when we value it as trash to begin with. And so if, for a group of people that were raised in a generation that is accustomed to not valuing things, and here's the sad thing, and we've allowed that to creep into our lives concerning our relationships, and then we don't value people either. If there's something that's valuable, you will look at it, you will care for it, you will make sure it's taken care of. Come on, somebody. If you have a relationship in your life, and if it is valuable to you, if there's a flaw that shows up, you won't throw it away. You won't throw it in the trash and say, man, we need to repair this. And so in the home, if we won't honor in the home, because here's the sad thing, a lot of people, they're afraid to get too close to you because if you get too close, then they'll, you will see their flaws and they're afraid that you're going to discard them and throw them in the trash. Because many times that's happened in their past, they got close enough to somebody that they let their guard down, allow their flaws to be seen, and they were discarded and thrown by the wayside because they weren't treated as valuable and they didn't value themselves. But I'm here to tell you this morning, regardless of what value that others have placed on you, God has valued you, has made you worth the blood of his only son. And when other people see you as trash, God sees you as treasure. And what other people would throw away, what other people would walk by, not even give it a second glance, God stopped by and picked you up and wiped you off and poured in some oil, poured in the wine, come on now, and filled you with himself. And so now we're not just valuable because of what we're made from, but we're valued because what is filling us on the inside. And God's love is on the inside of us. His presence is on the inside of us. Yeah. Look to your neighbor so you know you're God's child. If you're born again, you are a child of God. Listen, this is one reason why when you get married, you be very, very careful how you treat your spouse is because God is their father. And so if you've got, you got a child, a son or daughter, and you know they've been treated wrongly by their spouse, as a parent, you want to call them up and say, hey, 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 wait a minute. That's my girl. That's my boy. You're treating this way. And you also need to be careful if you marry somebody that's not saved because then you've got their father-in-law to deal with. Come on, somebody. Because if you're not born again, your dad's the devil. Well, that's what Jesus said. He said, you're of your father the devil. And he was talking to the religious people. But God's valued you. You know yourself, you'd be walking down the street and you see a piece of paper, you won't even give it a second glance unless you're sensitive to the Holy Ghost. I mean, there's something about me. It's hard for me to walk by trash and not pick it up. 
I mean, it disturbs me. If I, try, if I drive up on the parking lot and there's a piece of trash, it's like that bothers me. Let me tell you a secret. If I walk downtown Logan and I see a piece of trash, that bothers me. Because you know what? It's a lack of honor. But it's a funny thing to me that people throw a fit if you've got behind somebody. They throw a Mountain Dew bottle out of their car. I mean, they call them up, report them. But you can disregard people and not think a same thing about it. See somebody on the side of the road, pass them right up, see a piece of trash, you get upset. See, the enemy would like to treat you and treat you in such a way where he lies to you, blinds you, to where you value things more than people. And so we've sold ourselves for things. I, fa- I found myself at times trying to watch a stupid television show. And my son, my e- only eternal possession, want my attention, and I look over him to watch a ball game. And I don't know none of you all would be tempted to do anything like that at all. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it's okay for the child to be disrespectful. And, but listen, if we would just weigh what we consider as valuable, what could we ever weigh as more valuable than our own kids or our own spouse? What could, what could we weigh that's more valuable than that? So if we want to be able to have a godly home, We've got to allow honor to be restored into our homes. Now, and it doesn't come automatically. It's going to come as a result of fresh encounters with God. In other words, we're not just going to quote the Scripture. You can put the Scripture on your door. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And you can even hack him when you read it if you want to. But you can post that on your wall. You can put scriptures on your refrigerator, scriptures in your cabinet, scriptures in your bathroom. But if you're not living those scriptures, those scriptures mean nothing to you. And don't ever expect they're going to mean anything to your kids. Because they don't hear what you say. They watch what you do. And when you talk to them and you're always criticizing your spouse and your kids. Now listen, I'm going I'm to say something here. It's a little bit bold and it might hurt you. But it's okay because God's already helped me with it. <laughs> in other words, he rebuked me for it too. And so I'm just passing along this information. Don't shoot the messenger. But when we live in a generation and we're used to dealing with cheap stuff, don't treat people like cheap stuff. Now, let me say this. Stop talking to them like they're trash. Stop fussing. Stop quarreling. Let me tell you something. Broken people are a result of broken relationships. Don't be breaking people because of the way you're treating them. We have got to develop such an awareness of the presence of God, not in the church building, not in the song service. We've got to learn to value the presence of God in the people that we live with. In other words, when I talk to my wife, I need to be talking to her like she's God's daughter. I value her like she is a princess, a daughter of the king. Royalty with royal blood flowing in her veins. Because if I treat her as the valued princess that she is, then I got access to the king's inheritance. Now, I have my own inheritance, but that's none of my business. That's for her. Because God is sharing with me an inheritance that belongs to her, and the way she's going to access the inheritance that God is hidden in me, it's a gift from God. But when she shows honor to me, she unlocks that inward potential that God's hidden in me, but her praise in me will help bring it to the surface. So when you see something in your child, you see something in the people that you love that you don't like, stop mouthing about the part you don't like, the part they're not doing. Well, they're so lazy. They're a bum. They're useless. What's wrong with them? And if that's all you do is just point out the faults and the flaws, you're empowering those things to become a wedge in between the two of you. And your cursing is tearing the relationship apart. 
any wartime strategist knows that one of the number one ways to defeat any enemy is, is to get involved with the lines of communication. If you can't communicate with the people that you're with, how can you operate as a team when the lines of communication are hindered? Now, you understand, in order to have the proper lines of communication concerning signals, radio, television, now we've got internet, Wi-Fi, and all kinds of stuff, you've got to have a transmitter and a receiver. But when you're arguing, you've got two transmitters in operation at the same time, and no receivers are turned on. So there's no information being shared across the airwaves during a fight. Just look straight ahead. Nobody will know you need this at all. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. But just give me a few moments here. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3. The New Living or New King James says it is honorable for a man to stop striving since any fool can start a quarrel. Look at your neighbor and say, only fools would quarrel. Now I wanna I wanna encourage you now. The next time you're in an argument with your spouse, this is not the time <laughs> to use this scripture. Unless you just want to use it on yourself. My mom would always say this. Look at your neighbor and say, Mama said. Only counts when it's scriptural. Mama said. I feel, I feel like, uh, is it Happy not Happy Gilmore, uh, Waterboy. My, 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 my mama said, my mama said. Alligators are mad because they got all them teeth and no toothbrush. No, Mama said it takes two to have an argument. It takes two to have an argument. So I want, to, I want to challenge you. Next time you find yourself in the middle of an argument, just think to yourself, maybe you need to say it out loud, say, wait a minute, only a fool would quarrel. Any fool can quarrel. But it takes honor to stop a fight. Why is it such a big deal? I'll tell you why. Because it's dishonor. And dishonor is devaluing the individual. When you're fighting and fussing with somebody, you are taking the value from them and putting it on you. I'm more valuable than you are. And that's not what you're saying, but that's what they're hearing. See, there is a, there is a breakdown of communication in the home. What the man is saying is not what the wife is hearing. And what the wife is saying is not what the husband is hearing. Because there is a breakdown of communication because we do speak two different languages. Men can have a full conversation for two days with only ten words. <laughs> On the average, a female will speak twice as many words during the day than a male. You ever read the Amplified Bible? Authored by a woman. It's three times as thick as this one. They're given to detail. When my wife asks me what I do today, just being at work is not sufficient. She wants to know what I did, who I was with, who was helping me. How long did it take? Was it hard? Was it complicated? How did you figure that out? I don't understand how you did that. That is awesome. You want to know what I did? I'm sitting there thinking, right now, no. I'm worn out from having to explain what I did. I'm kind of overloaded with information right now. And so what's being communicated is that I don't care. And that's the problem. Because I do care, it's just the way that it's being communicated is different than the way I would like for it to be communicated. My idea of packaging it is different than her idea of packaging it. So we have to learn if we're going to be able to communicate, 
When I went to Haiti, I had to have an interpreter. I feel like when I first got married, I needed an interpreter here. Because <laughs> obviously what I'm saying is not being received. But here's the thing. If I value and honor the relationship, I will take time to figure out why it's not working. Rather than in this day and age, you just trade her in for another one. And so now we're in a society where people can't figure out the opposite sex. So they said, forget the opposite one. I'm just going with the same one I got. Man, at least I can talk to them. <laughs> people are so insecure, they want somebody just like them. It's blinded by the enemy. God wants to give us light on how to bring honor and value back in the home. If there's a lot of arguing going on, well, we're just strong-willed. No, you're carnal. You need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. You're selfish. You're not valuing one another. Come on now. Now, I know that some people may not be vocal, so they don't argue. They just walk out. Oh, that makes it a lot better. Because nothing communicates, I love you, like I'm gone for 24 hours. You ain't going to see me or know where I've been. Come on, somebody. So you, can, you got this group of people, that's why we argue. You got this group of people that say, well, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just going fishing. I'm taking the long way home. I'm going to stop by the bar on the way home. At least the boys there can understand me. And so then you see what the enemy now, he's got a great momentum in the home, hasn't he? Because nobody's communicating. Everybody's talking, but nobody's listening. Honor. Somebody say honor. honor. One outflow of honor you'll see is humility. In other words, the Bible says, esteeming others better than yourself. If you're going to be happily married, are you going to raise kids? Or are you just going to function in society? we got to learn how to esteem other people as valuable. And at the time when you're in my presence, you are more important than I am. You've been around people that when you got in their presence, they made you feel like they had been waiting all year long to see you. I'll give you an example. Arnold and Barb Dameron. When you run into them two, you're, you, you just automatically assume they have been waiting for months just to get to see you. People want to be with people like that. Now, let me tell you something. Husband, wife, if you're not like that to your spouse, they don't want to come be around you. No wonder they're taking a the long way home. No wonder they're trying to pick up extra work. It ain't because they need the extra money. It's like, I don't want to go home. Who wants to be around them? Now, you don't control their emotions. But you can control their environment. They can choose how they react in the environment that you set around you. But when they're in your presence... You should not be giving them more ammunition. We just came through revival, remember? We was excited about being filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not God's plan for the church house to be more spiritual than your house. In the New Testament... This is no longer the house of God unless we're here. In other words, God doesn't dwell in houses made with men's hands now. The Bible says we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So the most spiritual place that your kids would ever experience is at the dining room table at prayer time. Amen. Because you can have Holy Ghost knock down drag outs three or four times a week. 
But if you go home and the atmosphere is totally different, it's, I'm going I'm to have to be the one to break this to you. The kid does not maintain the atmosphere that he receives at church. They maintain the atmosphere that is taught to them at home. So what's more real to them at home is what they're going to be developed in. That's where, they're, that's where they're cultivated. That's where they're nurtured. The Bible says train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they're older, they'll not depart from it. It's important that we value the gifts of God that God has placed in inside of our kids. You know what's important? That we understand their callings even before they do. You show me someone who is truly called of God, truly an overseer in the body of Christ, they'll begin to recognize callings and giftings within the congregation before the individual notices it. The pastor that I was called of God under recognized I had a call in my life before I knew it. And it should be that we don't regard our friends, family, and especially our children after the flesh. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, that we regard no man after the flesh. Remember, he's talking about we walked with Jesus, we knew him naturally, but now we don't, we don't follow him this nat- from a natural person, but we regard him according to the Spirit. It's so important that we see others in the light of they, who they are spiritually first. Now think about this example, I'm going to close. You know the story of King David and how he was called and Samuel went to Jesse's house because God told him that there is a king in the son of Jesse and I want you to go anoint him as king, the next king of Israel. So Samuel goes to Jesse's house and Jesse says, call your sons. God is going to anoint one of your sons to be the next king. So he calls his sons and Samuel's getting ready to go anoint the oldest and he's the tall, he was better, he was the best looking and he's getting ready to anoint him as king because he's the firstborn and God says, wait, what are you doing? This ain't him. And so he looked over the son and said, wait a minute, you got another son somewhere? And Jesse says, oh, well, yeah, I mean, I got one out there in the field. Talking about self-esteem problems. David didn't even get invited to the inauguration. And the, the worst part about this is, is Jesse was raising a king in his house and didn't recognize him. Because he viewed him according to the natural. The Bible says he was ruddy. In other words, the, one translation said he was short and red-headed, which if you're a Jew, that kind of stands out. In other words, you're not, you're not kingly. And of course, if you look in Psalm 51, the Bible says, King David writing says, In sin, my mother conceived me. And so you'd have to assume from that that actually he had a different mom than the rest of the sons. And more, most likely, he was a result of a little illegitimate relationship. I, mean, I don't know how much more plain you can get. In sin, my mother conceived me. Let me tell you something. God can make a miracle out of any kind of mess you was ever born into. And it could be that Jesse was upset. He didn't want King David in the room because he didn't look like the rest of the boys because they got a different mom. And he didn't want Samuel to understand that Jesse ain't perfect. Let me tell you something. He already knew he wasn't perfect because he didn't even invite one of his sons. Come on now. How many kings, doctors, business leaders do we have right? And we're, and we're saying, get out of the way. I'm trying to watch the ball game. Now, why in the world did you make a C on your report card? You can do better than that. You ain't even motivated. What's wrong with you? You ain't even trying. I found out this. I don't get motivated by, telling my, by you telling me I'm not motivated. Most likely, anybody that's not motivated are frustrated because they're not motivated. So they need purpose, come on now, given to them. Potential spoken over them. Blessing pronounced in them. And they will develop the gift on the inside of them. And it will bring the king to the surface. What you see is trash. God says, that's treasure. Speak into them. And they'll rise up to be it. So we can't look at our children. We can't look at our husbands and our wives and regard them after the flesh. Because you're missing out on the value that God has placed on the inside of them. And you're not going to be able to receive any of the potential that he's desiring for you to cultivate in them. 
Come on, praise builds people up. I said, praise builds people up. Now, I'm not saying you don't correct. The whole reason why I would correct my son is because I love him. And I don't want him driving off of a cliff. Now, I want him to know I forgive him. Because now we're in a generation where if you even try to bring any correction, people say, well, you don't love me. No, honey, that's why I do love you. That's why we're bringing this up. I forgive you. And, of course, the other popular statement is, well, you ain't supposed to judge. Well, it seems to me like you might be judging for me judging. If that was the context. It's a funny thing to me that people always saying you're not supposed to judge are always judging people, but some of them are exempt from that statement. And it's a whole misunderstanding been taken out of context. That's not the message. But I want my son to know that I love him and I forgive him. But he can't continue to get by with that behavior because it's going to result in disappointment for him in the future. So I have to bring some form of disappointment for him now so we can understand that disobedience brings pain. I'm not advocating you're supposed to beat your children. If you've got a child that you can just speak to, you know, really God designed shouting to be a celebration. And if you're constantly shouting at your kids, they're going to stop listening to you because they're not hearing anything. Now, if you shout one time to get their attention, but if you're constantly shouting, they're blocking you out. I said, they're blocking you out. Why is that? Because you're not transmitting real information. It was meant to be a signal to get their attention, but because you're shouting all the time, it just becomes white noise. It's like the boy that cried wolf. Well, they're always shouting about something. Who knows what it is today? Amen. Look straight ahead. Now nobody will know you need this at all. Amen. Because it's a natural part of the flesh. You want, you want to yell. It's devaluing. Only a fool can quarrel. And not feel convicted by it. If shouting could fix them, they'd already been fixed. If yelling and arguing and fussing could fix it, the world would have been in fine shape by now. And so when I discipline my son, I've got to let him know why. Now, there's some time to just say, well, because dad or mom said so. It was good enough, and it ought to be good enough right now. Don't, I'm just not open for debate, not open for discussion. When you give a child that's not ready options, they'll take the wrong ones. And you're just opening up the door for arguments. So occasionally we do ask him, what do you want for lunch? But if we ask him for that every meal, you know, there's a fine line between worshiping your kids and then treating them like trash. Somewhere in the middle. <laughs> in other words, the child is not the center of the home. The spouse is not the center of the home. And you are certainly not the center of the home. Jesus is to be the center of the home. So thank God for kids, but they're a gift of God you're responsible for. But don't let them make all your decisions. I've had people with parents of teenagers saying, well, you know, I, I was going to get them. I, they, they, they didn't want to come to church. They didn't want to come to church. But you sent them to school, they didn't want to go to school. I've had people with six and seven years old. No, they didn't want to come to church. You better go ahead and start putting some points on their card at the prison because you're going to need it. You better be going ahead and investing in a lawyer ahead of time because you're going to need it to bail their butt out of jail. So there is a fine line between doing everything that the child wants to do. Come on, somebody. But then also overcorrecting. In other words, constantly bashing. Because I found out a lot of times it's both. You got doing whatever the kid wants to do, but then you're constantly telling him he ain't no count. We can't take our advice on parenting from the world. And sadly, you can't watch much of the church nowadays either. Because not very many homes are filled with the Holy Ghost. If you had a godly parent in this day and age, I'm just going to tell you, the godly influences I had around my life, if I don't make a success out of this thing, I'm an absolute failure. 
Now, you don't know my family, so you don't understand that statement. But I had some men and women around me from the time I was born to continue to invest and invest and invest and invest in my well-being. But I'm here to tell you, if you didn't have those opportunities growing up, God has chosen you and called you and placed you in a family now where that he is your father. And he has given you a precious gift called the Holy Spirit. And when you learn to follow him, wow. When you're feeling low, he'll speak to you. If you get quiet and listen, and he'll remind you, no weapon formed against you can prosper. There's so much potential on the inside of you. And he'll begin to show you things that God's invested in you. So then you can line your, your language up with it. And you begin to value the gift of God that's on the inside of you. And then you begin to value the gift of God that's on to the people to the right and to the left of you. That way, you're not just stepping on people to get a promotion. You know, God's called us to be vessels of honor. And if you look in that scripture, he's talking about there's, gold, there's vessels of gold, precious metals, golds of wood, go, go, uh, vessels of honor, vessels of dishonor, some made out of metal, precious metal, some out of earth, some out of wood. You ever found something that was, that was like a precious metal, but it hadn't been taken care of? Maybe, a, maybe it's a, a bronze pot. or I remember uh, the house that we moved into when we got married, it had an old fireplace in it. It was over 100 years old, and it had like some, um, I guess it was a brass. Still got it. It's in my mother-in-law's house now. Okay, I remember when we moved in that, it was, you couldn't even tell that it was supposed to shine because it was like green looking. But we bought some stuff to rub on that. Come on now. Just because you haven't been polished don't mean you're still not able to shine. When you allow the Holy Spirit to get you around people, come on now, you start rubbing up against. There's something about when you're connected in the body, you come into the family of God, and you allow things and gifts on other people to rub up against you and to begin to polish you. Come on now. God has created you to shine like the stars. God has designed you to shine. You just need to be polished. We need to be polished. And the Holy Spirit will help to get you polished up. Now, you, if you're not shining, people can walk by you and not notice. But you take time in the presence of God, and you've allowed him to polish on you a little bit, you'll get people's attention. And it's not just to brag on you. It's to be able to point to God and say, He's the one that made me. Every good thing that you see in me, it is a gift from Him. If I'm shining, it's because He's been rubbing on me. His goodness and mercy is being developed in me. As I've, I'm allowing myself to be connected to a family there were other people. What if you begin to value the people that was around you like you would like to be valued? Not requiring anything in return, just looking, praying, God, help me to see the value in somebody else's life. When I'm on the way to church, you said, we should pray and say, Lord, help me. Whoever, you know who I'm going to sit next to. Now, a lot of us know because we sit in the same place every time we come. I would encourage you, move every now and then. Meet somebody different, Right? But ask the Lord, Lord, help me, at least in church, because people generally be more open in church than they would in the world, and you can practice here. See, a lot of times we're taught that the exciting stuff happens here. No, this is the place where we get ready for the exciting stuff. Amen. It should be exciting, but it shouldn't be the only place that exciting things happen in God. It should be that we should get so practiced and so polished here in our gifts that when we leave these four walls... That's where the real excitement begins to take place. And we can ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, help me to recognize what some people has recognized as trash, but help me to see it for the treasure that you've hidden in the inside of this. You know, we've all walked by a piece of paper, not picked it up, but then we walk by and see a $20 bill on the road. How many of you have been walking on the highway, you see, a, 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 see some money? It's like, oh, why do you take time to pick it up? You didn't pick up the other paper. It's all paper. Well, it's because you value. You see the value in it. So you take time to pick it up, dust it off. Glory to God. The Lord is good. (laughs) 
You begin to value the people in your home. Don't value people at church more than you do at home. Don't value people at work more than you do at home. Don't share with people intimate secrets that you would work with and not even bother telling your spouse. People have been hurt so much they got so many walls built because of wrong relationships. Don't judge your current relationships based on the past ones. Allow God to develop you around the people you're with now. It's worth repairing. There's value in it. Don't throw it away and try to get another one. I promise you, the next one you find is going to be just as broken as the one you got now because everybody's broken in a certain way. Say this prayer. Say, Father, teach me to value, honor, and respect the people in my home, my spouse, friends, children, whoever's there. Teach me to be sensitive, respectful, and to esteem them above myself. Putting them their well-being, their happiness above my own. Lord, help me to serve others, and I'll serve you in the process. Amen. You all stand up with me. If you're in this place.